So Qigong is just internal. It is the internal internal healing art. And then the martial art is the external. And we often think of external as harsh and internal as soft. And sometimes we think of that as strong or weak. And I can tell you, my family is rooted in the martial arts. Uh, my husband is a second degree black belt in two different styles. My son is a second degree black belt in one style. Um, I practiced with both the martial and the internal arts. And this is the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast, and I'm your host, Maya Acosta. If you're willing to go with me, together we can discover how simple lifestyle choices can help improve our quality of life. Let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about physical therapy and also beyond that, other modalities that we can use for health. So we'll learn about Tai Chi and Qigong. And we have Dr. Melissa Kerr, who is here to talk to us about that. So she's an integrative physical therapist with a unique skill set in integrative techniques and lifestyle medicine with certifications in yoga, Tai Chi, and Qigong. And Dr. Kerr provides mind-body approach to movement. And Dr. Kerr has additional training in nutrition and supports the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's recommendation to implement plant-predominant eating for optimized health. So welcome, Dr. Kerr. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. This is probably the first time that we explore in detail physical therapy first, and then, of course, the other modalities. So we're going to have questions like, what's the difference between yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong? And what exactly is Qigong? Um, so lots of questions. And um, I believe you'll tell us how this, these modalities can help us with overall wellness, physical health, uh, stress management, and all of that. Before we start, can we learn a little bit more about you? You are part of Be Well Therapies. That is correct. Yes, this is a company that I founded and created back in 2014 as I was transitioning from, I suppose, more of a traditional physical therapy role um, and starting to navigate blending my specific interest using contemplative movement, um, yoga and Tai Chi, transitioning that as a means of therapeutic exercise, which is the physical therapy term for movement. Um, and then wanting to bring in my other pieces of training, which include uh, dry needling, which is the Western version utilizing acupuncture needles. Um, it is not acupuncture as applied from a um, very specific acupuncturist, um, but it is, again, the Western uh, complementary approach. So I started this company, ended my time in the traditional healthcare role, and now navigate a part-time role with my business and a part-time role still in an insurance-based realm, but I have the pleasure of working for a company that allows me to really utilize um, my time and my skills in this very integrative manner. Well, congratulations on putting together this Be Well Therapies. And Dr. Michelle Thompson is part of your group, right? Absolutely. Yes. So we've had her on. And so by the time this episode airs, she will have her episode will have aired. So I'll make sure that I link that because one of the things that I enjoy about Dr. Thompson when we have these conversations is she always brings in that the aspect of the energy and working with our energy and being aware of how we're affected and how to calm the body down. And these are things that I love about um, lifestyle medicine, that it now incorporates that, but also just in general, things that we can do from our home to um, improve our health. So as a matter of fact, you touched on acupuncture, and I don't want to jump, jump around a lot, but I will tell you that I'm interested in a lot of these things. I learned about reflexology many years ago, mm -hmm. as a, and as a result, I have this habit every evening of doing these pressure points on my feet every evening, and usually I'm looking to see is something going on in my body, and I do it on my ear. So I don't know if you have a background in that as well. Yes. Um, one of the tools that I use in practice are ear seeds, and they are a way of applying auriculotherapy, which is applying pressure points onto the ears. I have used needles in the ears before, but I don't prefer them. I love the seeds. 
Um, and the specific seeds I use are from earseeds.com. Um, they're very big on self-management, self-application. But by applying pressure at specific points, we can change the chemicals that our body creates, which can then translate into um, a feeling of calm and relaxation. If we really know what points we're stimulating and what we're trying to manipulate, then our intention is going to have a carryover in that specific realm. If we're not quite certain what we're doing, there are some nice points for good for everything. And Shen Men is one of the points in the ear that I use um, because the science backs it. And with that research support, it's found to be effective. There is an equivalent point from Shen Men in the ear, in the body, on the hand, uh, large intestine four, LI4, and that's between um, the thumb and the index finger. That's one of those points that's yes. relatively good for everything. And then we also have a map of the body in the hands and in the feet, which is where we get reflexology from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've noticed that I tend to do a lot of this when I'm having a headache. Um, and yes. I don't know if the listeners can see, but that pressure point, that area that you just described, yes. I've become very aware of. And so I'm usually when I'm stressed or I have a headache or something's going on, I add pressure. When I'm yes. fine, if I press that area, I'm not feeling any sensitivity or pain. Yes. So the key with applying acupressure points um, is sustaining a pressure that is moderate and discomfort, not face making where we're grimacing and tensing <laughs> because when we're tense, we can't let the chi flow, but finding a, an ability to sit with the discomfort about 30 seconds to two minutes is where the Western application comes into play. Mm -hmm. And then you can play with either a steady hold or moving in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction, depending on your intention. Mm -hmm. If you're not certain whether you want to release or tonify, you do both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how did you decide on physical therapy as the career that you wanted to do or have? So when I was 16, I had been battling some ankle injuries uh, from sports over a period of years and finally got to the point where I was having so much discomfort and it was inhibiting my performance that we ended up um, consulting with an orthopedic. I'd had a surgical procedure and postoperatively I was to attend physical therapy. I started going to um, my therapy after school and found that this whole world seemed to be like right in line with what I wanted to do. It, um, it was wonderful. I, I watched my therapists do their job. They seemed to love it. They had a lot of variety and movement and it certainly wasn't boring. So I decided at that point I was going to scrap my uh, intention of going into journalism and, and do English and, and, and a writing major and go into the medical field with physical therapy. And that's what I did. I um, went to school. I did a crash course and condensed my undergraduate work, got accepted and, and, and so on and so forth. Yes. And so we did talk a little bit before we started recording about what the requirements look like for someone going into physical therapy. So how has that changed from the time you enter the field to now? What are right. what can people expect if they choose that field? So when I entered into my desired program, it was the early 90s. And at that time, it was a bachelor's degree. As I progressed through my degree, I was the last class at the Medical College of Ohio, which is now uh, the University of Toledo. Um, I was the last class to graduate from that institution with a bachelor's degree. They had transitioned into master's degrees. And over a period of the next five to 10 years, that has transitioned into doctorate degrees. So now entering into the field, you need to have a four-year undergraduate degree, get accepted to the program, and then you graduate with a doctorate. Now, this doctorate is a clinical doctorate, not to be confused with a PhD or an academic doctorate. And they have also recently expanded into four, I think it's four additional terminal degrees. So there is a DSC and there's a few other letters of the alphabet combinations where it's a doctorate of science. Um, Youngstown State University, where I do some guest lecture teaching 
They have a PhD slash PT program. So it's, it's a whole new world of finding this advancement. To go into the realm of academia, you do need a PhD. So that is one of the reasons I think they've tagged in um, a parallel with the PT, or I'm sorry, the doctorate of physical therapy and the PhD. Uh, it complicates, complicates things a little more for people who are interested. They're having to spend a lot more time studying if they actually want to practice. It does. One of the things that's a challenge in today's realm is the return on investment. So we look at what you're putting into your education mm -hmm. and then what you can expect to get back in terms of salary. And it used to be a very nice balance. And like many things in the um, current state of the economic affairs, it becomes a real question of the amount of time and, and money that you're putting into this. What are we going to do with that when we come out? Mm -hmm. um, because of the timing of getting my bachelor's degree, there was a window of time that a transitional doctorate program um, was available, which I had enrolled in. And I completed my uh, transitional doctorate program in, I believe, 2017. I was very pleased with the program that I worked with, which was AT Still University, because I was able to focus my um, my area of interest in the integrative realm. So mm -hmm. a lot of my capstone projects and my, my final projects were related to comparing the um, traditional standard physical therapy approach to chronic nonspecific low back pain compared to a yogic approach. And I really got to mm -hmm. delve deep into the research of yoga and the parallels mm -hmm. with um, Western medicine and Eastern thought and and what's more effective, a yogic approach or or a traditional approach? So, yes, that's uh, and we'll explore more about that. I love that whole idea. Before I myself needed a physical therapist, I always wonder. Well, I you think of people going to physical therapy when they've had an injury or an accident, mm -hmm. for example. I wonder if you can paint a picture for us of what it's been like for you. Like, what sort of cases do you treat? Um, and then we can move on to how you incorporate the use of energy. Sure. So when I was doing what I consider more traditional therapy, when I worked for a health system, I, you know, you tend to treat what um, you're assigned. So with a health system, I would see post-operative knee replacements and hip replacements and always chronic back pain. That was a real big diagnosis that was common, um, shoulder injuries and the like. So since I transitioned into more of the integrative realm, and I've had the pleasure and the complete privilege to align with Dr. Thompson, um, because we have a similar approach, I've been fortunate to receive um, a lot of individuals who know of us or have experienced our um, um, back in the pre-pandemic days when we would do live in-person events, people who are seeking balancing their health and are coming specifically, excuse me, specifically for that integrative approach. We've had the pleasure of looking at the lifestyle medicine pillars and trying to balance um, someone who's having chronic issues in many cases, maybe chronic pain with how we can sleep differently and eat differently and find ways that are meaningful to move. And in my own body, I have a history of um, a lot of digestive uh, dysfunction uh, from a young age and experiencing uh, surgeries and procedures um, when I was eight. And then revisiting a lot of these um, dysfunctions after having my second child. And at that point, I realized I really needed to up my game a little bit more, inform myself and really take control of, of what was going on because I was not finding a lot of success in the traditional medical realm. My tests would come back normal and, and I was to multiple specialists and multiple um, institutes where everything looked fine, but I didn't feel fine. So through a process of employing people that I found to be um, at the top of their game and that I trusted and that had a little broader perspective and approach to things rather than very myopic, I was able to um, follow the um, Ayurvedic approach, which is Ayurveda is the sister science of yoga. And the number one principle is you, the person, are responsible for your health, nobody else. 
So I was empowered to employ people that I felt had my best interest in mind. And they started me off on a path that I then continued from personal experience into the professional realm, which is really looking at the thoughts we think, the foods we choose, the way we accept um, um, people into our lives and what our surroundings do for us, and really looking at balancing constructive and destructive. And this is where the whole energetic piece has a really nice role. Wonderful, because we're going to talk about that. Um, so I, uh, before I do that, I want to mention that I had said to you that a niece of mine wants to go into physical therapy. It's, and it's interesting that she chose that field in a sense, because she has seen my sister endure a lot of um, health problems, and has sort of been that uh, provider or caretaker for my sister. Mm -hmm. And she ha she attended the physical therapy sessions that my sister was having. Um, and so I myself, my experience with physical therapy was a frozen shoulder from a fall that I had, I didn't even realize that I had a an injury until I could no longer move my shoulder. And my experience was positive. I, um, this particular center had a chiropractor who would do the adjustments and then followed by a physical therapist and sometimes a massage therapist who would help oh. me with my shoulder. So we avoided what could have been, I guess, surgery. Um, however, I, I found myself speaking to them about nutrition, nutrition and lifestyle medicine, because as you know, uh, that's rare in many of these fields. But yes. um, what I like about what, this conversation that we are going to have is that many times these, um, these places, you know, physical therapists and other places only focus on that localized pain or injury and not overall wellness. Right. Um, I did like that I would, every time I visited the, the center, I felt like I was doing something for myself you know, that self care aspect. And then when all of that stopped, I thought, I should do something like this, like I should continue to pursue working with my body. And so let's move on to talk about energy. I want it. Uh, so I watched two of your videos where you explain what it all is the work that you do. And then another video, you actually demonstrate Qigong. Um, mm -hmm. I like this, what you said that um, uh, you said that uh, the root of all chronic disease seems to be stress related. And, um, and also, you've mentioned that the body itself goes into this sympathetic overdrive that we need to learn to control uh, through having, for example, daily practice. And mm -hmm. I've worked with a couple of coaches on trauma. So I know that the body stores trauma. I know that I now understand that energy can get stuck and all of that. Mm -hmm. So if, let's talk about Qigong. What is it? And uh, tell us about energy, because you've also said one more thing on here, which uh, I agree with you, even though I'm not in healthcare. You said Western medicine doesn't have anything that correlates qi with any other practice. So um, basically, they look at this, and I've had these conversations with, with my husband about energy. So we use medical devices that actually work with energy. So like mm -hmm. ultrasounds, MRI, CTs, biofeedback machines. And yet when we talk about working with energy itself, and, and for example, Tai Chi and Qigong, that's not, uh, Western medicine doesn't embrace that necessarily. Is that right? Correct. There, um, when we talk about chi, so depending on which spe which specific culture we're in, depends on how we spell. So there's Q I, there's C H I, there's K I, and um, it all is pronounced chi. In Sanskrit, from yoga, we have prana, and even though we often think of prana as breath and chi as energy, all of these terms mean life force. And there's 65 cultures that utilize life force, dependent on the word. And we in Western, in the Western world, we are not one of those 65 countries. So we don't really have a corresponding word to capture the life force. So qi means energy and gong means to cultivate work. So we're doing energy work. Sometimes the West will simplify and say, oh, we're moving blood 
or over moving breath, but, but Eastern practice has other concepts and words for those specific um, fluids for back, uh, fluid for blood and, and, and breath. It, it's a little bit different. So we have to step back a little bit and go, okay, you know, chi, breath, blood, whatever gets someone to not feel as though they're threatened by a term that they don't connect with, I find to be most important. So I try to approach educating people in a way where it meets them where they're at. And oftentimes I need to read their body language for that because I'm reading their energy. And when we talk about energy and how do we, how do we know there's energy, how do we read it? You know, some people can read auras. I've been around a number of people who are incredibly skilled at that. And that's a practice. It's something you have to work at. It doesn't necessarily just, you either have it or you don't. Um, but when we look at our diagnostic imaging um, machines, um, when we look at how we trace um, the energies of the heart with EKGs or ECGs, technically, how we trace our, our heart rhythm. We're reading frequencies. MRI machines are reading frequencies, CTs, whatever it is we're looking at. We're, we're picking up on things that are not visible to the eye in order to get a result. There's some really interesting research on the bioelectric field that surrounds our body. And again, you can call it an aura, if you like, or we can just talk about the energy that surrounds us. The energy from the heart really has an impact in terms of, of how it lies around us. Um, and it's said that when we're healthy and we're in a really wonderful state of balance, our energy field expands pretty immensely. And when we're in a state of dis-ease, or dysfunction, that field shrinks and it almost collapses in and upon us. So um, that's a real testament to wanting to keep our energy field, to keep our energy flowing and not having it be blocked. Because the Eastern statement of balance, it's, it's almost, a, a, it's an interesting statement. When something is stated very simply, oftentimes in the West, we kind of roll our eyes at it or we don't consider it to be important because it's it's so simple it must be easy and it's often the most simple concepts that are the most challenging so in eastern statements we're either in a state of ease which is balance or dis-ease which is imbalance so when we're in a state of balance our acupoints are open so that the chi flows and if an acupoint becomes closed, we start the state of imbalance or dis-ease. If multiple acupoints are closed, then we're in a larger imbalance or state of dis-ease. When we talk about stress being the root of chronic conditions, we look at um, what we have two types of stress. There's eustress and distress. And eustress is the good stuff. It's very short-lived in the body. It's the happy stress. It's, my goodness, we're planning a wedding or we're going to have this party or we're doing this stuff that's going to be wonderful. And stress is a motivator. We need stress. We just don't need it in too great of, a, of an amount for too long a period of time. So eustress is positive. Distress, chronic stress, is when we start to accumulate, whether it be large things that tip the scales and we stay there or get stuck there, or it's little things that just show up over a longer period of time. Kind of like putting a backpack on and every day you add an ounce of weight to the backpack. You don't notice an ounce necessarily because it's a small amount. But if every day you're adding an ounce, by the time you get to a year or two, you're going to feel it. And you're going to, you will have picked up so many ounces that are separate entities that you, you may not know where to start when it comes to unloading that backpack or de-stressing. So when we get accumulated stress or chronic stress, we change our chemicals and our hormones. We 
then have an impact in the immune system. And once the immune system starts to shift, then that generally translates into pretty much every other organ and every other system. As it is when our chemicals change, that's, that's our endocrine system starting to shift things. And we can shift that with a thought. We can think of something that's very triggering, or we can think of something that's very calming. And if we do something as simple as taking five to eight slow, deep breaths, we will change our chemical composition in those moments. We will see a de-escalation of, of our heart rate and our blood pressure, and then we get this domino effect. We might only be there for those five to eight breaths, but we're there, which with our stress system and our relaxation system, which is essentially our autonomic nervous system, our parasympathetic or our sympathetic, our relaxation or our stress, whatever we call these symptoms, they both cannot go in the same direction at the same time. So if the stress response goes up, the relaxation response go down. So this is goes down. This is our nervous system, like a seesaw, a teeter-totter, really starting to tip. If the relaxation response comes up, the stress response has to come down. So this is where the beauty of triggering the relaxation response has a massive impact on our health because we're starting to adjust our stress levels, which change our chemicals, our hormones, impact our immune system, and in turn impact all of our other systems in positive ways. So whether we do Tai Chi or Qigong or yoga, a, uh, a meditation, a breath work, in yoga it's a pranayama, any form of relaxation response enhancement is going to find benefit. Qigong just becomes an interesting choice. And again, you could, there's six or seven or 10 or however many others, but Qigong is interesting because it's not often something we tend to know a lot about in the West. And when we have something new introduced to us and we can keep an open mind, that usually sparks curiosity. And when we're curious, we're probably gonna fire centers of our brain that aren't frequently fired. And that sets up a whole new neural networking pattern. And specifically with something like chronic pain, we want curiosity. We want to think in a different manner. We want to reflect on self-awareness, which is it's going to then enhance our interoception, which then helps us break out of these destructive movement and thought and life patterns. So it, it, it's, there's a number of different ways to get to a place of enhancing the relaxation response. This is just one. Absolutely. I want to touch base or go back a little bit to where you were talking about that. In, in, in a sense, everything is energy, uh, whether Western medicine decides to embrace it or not or, or consider it at all. Uh, we do feel other people's energy. Yeah. Many of us can pick up on stress that other people are experiencing or the happiness or the good stuff. Contagion too. Um, it's real and yes. it's documented and it, it really has a huge impact and that should help guide us to knowing when our, we're surrounded with that feeling of, Ugh, you know, that's our energy yes. field. Sometimes we get that butterflies in our stomach or we get a pit in our stomach. We feel a, a very uneasy about something. The science suggests that's our enteric nervous system, which has a lot to do with our, our gut microbiome, but that travels significantly faster than what we generally use to perceive things. Um, but that's, that's what we also look at as our, our intuitive state. I have a bad feeling about this. Um, th that's something where we need to, when we recognize that, really need to listen to the, the signals that aren't obvious, um, almost tapping into your senses or a sixth sense, if you will, to, to get a better read on, is this where I need to be? Are these the people I need to be surrounding myself with right now? Is this space, whether there's a human in it or not, is this space constructive? 
Um, and if it's not, and that's what we need, then we need to look at our choices and, and consider, right? Should I change my environment? Should I go to a different room? Should I politely excuse myself and, and be mindful of the company that I keep? That's right, which oh, can be a difficult topic when we talk about creating boundaries. It's very true. But then we can also think if we show up in a space and, and think about smiling on the inside and allowing that to translate to the outside and maybe entering mm -hmm. the room from our heart space, that will fill up a room. And, mm. and love is our highest, love, joy, those are our highest vibration emotions. And if we can find mm -hmm. a way to cultivate that, not by painting pictures of rainbows and butterflies and making it seem as though this is great when that's a false reality, but, but really tapping into that energy and lifting that vibration, we can then create a contagion effect in the room that tends mm -hmm. to sit more on the positive side. Mm -hmm. um, I want to uh, mention this as well in terms of um, other modalities when it comes to therapy. And I'm not, I'm not saying that this is therapy, but in a sense, it really helps us to process things. So I now know, having worked with trauma-informed health coaches, that trauma and other things get stuck in the body. Yeah. And I started many years ago with what we consider to be talk therapy, um, which can be triggering. And, and take you back <laughs> to a space that it may not be very supportive. Now that I understand that what we need to do is, is, is listen to our bodies and our energy and the sensations and what's going on. Uh, for example, my coaches have taught me to, to every day check in, how am I feeling? Mm -hmm. And it's become so automatic that I can tell like throughout the day, oh, I'm feeling relaxed today mm -hmm. or, oh, I'm getting upset. I'm feeling it in my body. Obviously, I feel everything in my body first. I, I'm very aware, but I but tuning in every day. So a practice like what you're talking about could really help to move that energy and then get me to a, a better space, a better place. Yeah. So. What does your practice look like today in terms of now that you incorporate this energy work and have you expanded outside of working with, you know, injuries and just recovering out from procedures? Yeah. So oftentimes when I'll meet with clients and, and when I'm in my Be Well Therapies business, um, that's a cash-based business. When I'm in the insurance realm, we, we use insurance and I'm an employee of a company I try not to let those, um, the payment manner have an impact, but oftentimes in my cash-based practice, I get people who want to explore like why they're stuck or, or you know, trying to figure out, you know, how to stay um, proactive about things. Regardless, we want to look at like, you know, what's your story? I, I need to know a little bit about who you are um, what comes to mind? What brings you to see me? Like you might have had, you know, I, I hurt my shoulder. Yeah, but but tell me your story. You know, I would say twenty five percent of the time it's just an injury, or or it's, it's it's something that's actually simple in that regard. But but the other seventy five percent is listening to someone unravel things. Um, oftentimes with chronic issues, there's there's what we think is going on, and then there's the stuff that we tend to block out. And so I try to use um, active listening skills and open-ended questions to try and help people get comfortable exploring their story. And they tend to recall things that, oh, right, I forgot about this. And sometimes I'll ask people, what do you think the root cause is? What do you think started this? Where do you think this stems from? And, and I'll give them the example, like, you know, did you fall off a horse when you were 12 years old? Um, and, and it's amazing how many people have fallen off horses or have something very similar to that. There's something that happened that they believe started this course of events that is indirectly or directly led them to where they are. And it's that that I want to know about. I can't change that, but it really helps me understand maybe how they've adapted or maladapted or gotten themselves into behavioral choices that tend to compensate or um, 
whatever the case may be. And if it's something that's traumatic and triggering through my work with the Centers for Mind-Body Medicine, they've, um, they do a lot of teaching of, of skills that help us work through that. Um, sometimes I have to be very careful of staying in my lane so that I don't cross over into a scope of practice that I'm not qualified with. But I do not believe that talking with someone to explore topics is um, inappropriate. I think that's very appropriate. And then if something should surface, then we definitely have the conversation about if other healthcare providers need to be engaged in an area. But when I learn the information about how they would tell their story or what chapter they're writing in their book, that helps me get, a, get, get an idea of what a good approach for unblocking or um, addressing this realm may be. And, um, you know, it becomes something that then we, we individualize or personalize to that specific person. I don't necessarily get into, um, well, it's your lung meridian that's blocked and we need to unblock it this way. But, you know, I might explore things like, do you find yourself waking up at the same time every morning and you have a hard time going back to sleep? From my background, that can then tell me like, okay, you know, if they're always waking up between these hours, then there may be something impacting an element or a meridian. So then I'll start to ask people, tell me about, you know, grief. Grief is related to the lung meridian. You know, is there an imbalance of grief? Or do we have any issues with anger? Or do we look to yang to yin, which is more, you know, masculine, feminine? So these actually concepts that sound very non-Western, they actually give me a lot of information and insight that I can then take and apply in a Western physical therapy realm setting to figure out an appropriate treatment intervention. So I don't necessarily always want to like just make the shoulder better, but I want to make the, the, the body feel balanced so that the shoulder then can, can move freely and function freely. And the mind is a little less um, focused on, you know, it's this pain, it's this pain. And we, we just can't seem to find what's wrong with it. Um, those are the things that excite me and intrigue me and that I feel called to help people um, unravel. People, it doesn't have to be like an actual physical injury that comes through, but it could be something within their lives that they want to enhance or improve. And through the physical aspect of it, the physical work of unblocking energy, they can be in a, in a better place. You also, since we were talking about lifestyle medicine as well, you have um, what you call, I, I believe you incorporate functional nutrition mm -hmm. for chronic pain. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So um, sometimes in, in discussing diagnoses with people, some people have no medical diagnoses and some people have volumes. Um, and we don't want to get married to a diagnosis, but when we look at someone maybe um, dealing with autoimmune dysfunction or autoimmune disease, that can help me look to, let's take a peek at what the evidence suggests with nutrition that might be most appropriate for someone with an autoimmune focus. And the Mediterranean diet in this example has the best research for um, that component. Now, within some of the specific diagnoses in the autoimmune realm, there's actually some benefit to um, a keto diet approach and not long-term keto, but if we look at something like uh, multiple sclerosis, there's research that supports um, three to six months of keto followed by three to six months of Mediterranean and 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 the alternating of that. So that's something that we can have a conversation about and discuss. In general, if we're looking to reduce inflammation in the body for whatever the reason may be, we wanna to look to the plant predominant approach. Mediterranean is a more friendly approach for people who really do like um, animal products, but maybe want to minimize them or would be open to minimizing them. Plant predominant doesn't technically include the realm of, of animal products, but 
trying not to get too held into labels, but using the evidence to guide things, we start to have these conversations. And it's, it's not stepping into the realm of dietetics, but it's saying, well, let's take a baseline look at what your eating habits look like right now. Do we eat at regular times? Do we snack frequently? How close before bed are we eating our last meal or snack? And then we can step back and say, well, can we maybe reduce the amount of processed foods we're eating because we know that leads to inflammation? Can we reduce our meat selections because we know that leads to inflammation? Can we add in more fruits and vegetables? The science for optimal health with that is 10 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. So for some people, it's, can we just look to getting these 10 servings in? And that, that might be too big of a goal to reach toward to start with. So we want to set ourselves up for success and not for failure. So first we have to know our baseline. And then we have to see what an individual is open to. For people who are pre-contemplative, they have no interest in stepping into that realm, then, then it's the evidence shows it is not a good approach to say, well, we're going to do this anyhow. We have to look to um, what an individual is willing to consider. So when someone doesn't want to take the food approach, I'll say, well, let's talk about sleep, right? Can we, can we look at how our sleep schedule is? And in turn, if our sleep is between the seven to nine hours of recommended sleep and it's restful sleep, then we're in a good place. The average American is not in that seven to nine hours per night of restful sleep. So that might be an area we would choose to explore in place of nutrition. Well, and you said it early on, you meet them where they are at. Yes. And, um, and whatever is doable for them, whatever will, whatever will keep them working towards their health, is where they're going to start. And, uh, and all you can do is kind of share the information, share the literature, and then if they want to come on board fully, then the options are there. But I, I do agree with you that the Mediterranean diet seems to be more appealing yes. for people who are wanting to move away from where they are in terms of their nutrition. And then you also talked about reducing inflammation with some, some of the foods. So now we have the nutrition aspect and we also have the unblocking of the energy. I did say that if you wanted to sort of demonstrate or do a, a little something sample of what a Qigong exercise looks like, that you're more than welcome to do that. Our listeners can also hear it or they can always watch the YouTube video. And I, and I, and I say that because I watch one of your videos um, where you're actually guiding people towards this. So would you like to share anything with us about I that? I would love to. And it's so hard for me to just pick one. But when we're talking about chi, um, sometimes with practice, we will be able to really tap into what that feeling is. Some people feel it sooner than others. But with anything we do with energy work, you cannot be too rigid. You cannot be too tense. You really have to just melt into it and allow things to be. So if you can place both of your feet comfortably on the floor, we don't want crossed ankles, knees, crossed legs. We want the entire sole of the foot to be in contact with the earth. We have a lot of acupoints down there two to three specific to balancing ourselves and grounding. But the soles of the feet rest comfortably on the earth. Then we're going to take our hands and you're going to gently bring your palms to touch and your fingers to touch. So much like prayer hands or Anjali Mudra, if you're familiar with that. And this looks a little more like a yogic practice to start with, but the palms are going to touch. You're going to take your eyes and you're going to gaze down and you're going to slowly allow the hands to separate the least amount possible so that the fingertips aren't touching. So you want to hover your fingers as close together as you can, but not touching. And then you're going to look at your wrists and you're just going to straighten the wrists out so they're not bent. So the fingertips will be close to touching you're going to let the fingers just relax. So they'll take a very soft bend and we want the wrist to be straight. So this will allow the heels of the hand to separate more than the fingertips. So it's almost like you're making a triangle, if you will, but with very soft fingers, because when we look to the wrists, if they're very bent back, 
it's like bending a garden hose that turn that's turned on you'll you'll reduce some of the flow so with the wrists straight the fingers close to touching the fingers relaxed and softened you're going to take your gaze and you're going to look between the centers of your palms and if you could visualize a string or a line connecting the center of one palm to the center of the other palm. And you'll start to maybe even close the eyes. You can still visualize that connecting point between the hands. We're connecting a pericardium eight point in the center of the palm. This is how we often give and receive energy to the world and from the world, to others and from others. You're going to try to tap into the feeling, the space between the fingertips and the space between the palm. Maybe you can relax the fingers a little bit more, relax the arms. And if you can feel this magnetic-like sensation, like the ends of two magnets coming together, almost touching, that's the chi that we're looking to tap into. If you don't feel it, that's okay. Keep the face soft, the teeth slightly separated. Maybe bring the tongue to touch the roof of the mouth. And then much like you would be pulling an accordion apart, start to separate the hands maybe a few inches. And then bring the hands to touch, not quite touch, bring them back to their starting place. Fingers close but not touching. And then separate the hands, moving them away from each other. And then move them toward each other, fingertips not touching. Inhaling, guide the hands away from each other. Exhaling, guide the hands toward each other. So we're starting to take these soft movements, inhaling, separating the hands. Exhaling, bringing the hands closer. You can move the hands an inch, a foot, however far apart, and then compressing back together. We start to move with the breath. Inhale, floating the hands apart. Exhale, pressing the hands together. The more you practice this technique, the more you may start to become aware of the magnetic-like feel as the fingers and palms get closer to each other. We're connecting the pericardium eight acupoints. We're taking a very mindful approach to our movement. We're aware of our breath. We're grounding through the feet. We'll take one more inhaling to separate the hands. Exhaling to bring them all the way to gently touching. Hands come back to touching. Take an inhale and when you exhale, softly blink the eyes open, release the hands down. I could feel my energy, it's so beautiful. It is amazing the first time you feel that. Now, sometimes mm -hmm. you'll go back to it and you're like, I can't get it, relax. You may not have it every time, but if you chase it, you won't get it. And that's mm. the beautiful thing about this practice. Mm -hmm. We have to be in a state of applying tensegrity, which is the least amount of muscle contraction to hold the shape, but no more. So mm -hmm. we're not rigid. We're not tense. We're allowing things to flow. This exercise that we just did brought me to being present with myself and, yeah. and just focusing on that. Is this something, and I know that it could become very elaborate, the, the practice mm -hmm. of Qigong, but when would I do this? Uh, when could our listeners benefit um, by practice, just doing this simple exercise? So anytime we feel like we're in a heightened state, this becomes incredibly mm -hmm. valuable. If we are if we know what stress feels like in our body in an unhealthy way, when someone says, just take a deep breath, do this practice. <laughs> when we feel like we're going to be going into a space that might be challenging for us, go into this practice. The, one of the better times to do a Qigong practice is first thing in the morning. That doesn't happen for everyone. So don't set yourself up for failure. 
I find that applying things in small amounts more frequently during the day, it helps to regulate the nervous system more because if we take five or 10 minutes into the one area and crunch it together, we have 23 hours and X amount of minutes in the remainder of the day. And we're kind of just carving out this small little space. But if that's the best we can do, that's the best we can do. And that's okay. All we ask is that we do our best. Our best is good enough. Our best every day is going to look different. But if we have days where we can incorporate this uh, multiple times throughout the day, we're regulating the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. When the relaxation response goes up, the stress response comes down. We know that chronic stress causes significant cardiovascular compromise. So we're, we're, we're doing our heart health a favor. We're doing our immune system a favor, our endocrine system. I mean, it just becomes this beautiful domino effect. And it doesn't take 30 minutes. Um, it, it, it could, but it doesn't have to. And Qigong is dose dependent. So the mm. more we practice, the, mm -hmm. the more duration we, I guess, have during the day. And it's not so much that more is better, but in this case, you know, that may, that may very well be true, but we also have to be very kind and forgiving. We do our best. Your best is all yes. you can do. That's right. I love this. I feel so relaxed right now. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's incredible like it. <laughs> what that short period of time can do to the to how you feel. So then you, you check in before you practice, you check in after you practice. And the hope is that you're like, oh, I feel kind of like hot wax, just kind of melting toward the earth. And if you feel like you're just like, oh my gosh, this isn't walk away right? What okay. we don't want to yes. do is become so attached to like, what's the movement? Um, one thing we discussed earlier, Qigong is the grandfather of Tai Chi. Not all Tai Chi is Qigong. Qigong is an internal healing art. The whole point is to um, enhance the body's ability to self-heal, to open acupressure points, to open meridians, to allow the chi to flow more freely. Should, uh, technically, it's to allow the meridians to be better balanced and, and to allow the chi to flow. Tai Chi is either rooted in the internal art, which is a practice of Qigong, or it's rooted in the external art, which is self-defense, the martial art. So depending on the style of Tai Chi you're practicing would depend on whether it's a healing constructive art or a destructive martial art. Your intention matters the most. So even if you've learned some form that's destructive, if your intention is to help your body find peace or heal or whatever term sits best in your body, that's mm -hmm. what you're going to get out of it. If your intention during a practice is focused on what you have to do next, that's what you're going to get out of it. So usually at the end of a practice, if you're feeling heightened, we have to check back in. Where was I allowing my thoughts to go? The mind leads the chi. So if the mind is often wandering and thinking about all these things and the what happens and what could and blah, 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 that's where the energy goes. Right. So if the mind is focused in the present. That's where the energy goes. And that's the okay. only place where we live in the present moment. That's right. So there, uh, and you just touched on it, but I think there's also the, the medical component, meaning you're working on your health, yes. uh, enhancing your health or improving. The, there's the spiritual component that I see, and then the martial arts Yes. for Qigong as well. So Qigong is, is just that... internal. It is the inter internal. internal healing art. And then the okay. martial art is the external. And we yes. often think of external as harsh and internal as soft. And sometimes we think of that as strong or weak. And I can tell you, my family is rooted in the martial arts. Uh, my husband oh. is a second degree black belt in two different styles. My son is a second degree black belt in one style. Um, I've practiced with both the martial and the internal arts. And not to take anything away from it, but for me, the internal arts is much more challenging because I struggle with being still. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I like to multitask. <laughs> I like to go, go, go. So I enjoy teaching. Teaching is not the same as being the student and taking, but the teaching helps keep my brain in a better place so that when I'm a student, I better understand the I need to be present. 
the martial aspect is is where I find, um, although it is challenging in its own right, um, you can be allowed to be much more like an aerobic exercise. You can be a little bit all over the place and still accomplish what your your goal maybe for that moment is. Yeah, very true. So now I for anyone who might be interested in learning from you or taking one of your classes or programs that you have, uh, let's talk first about Be Well Therapies, because you said that before the pandemic, you were doing things in person. Um, what does that look like? Do you what, what are you doing today with that? Do you offer um, telehealth? And also, uh, what things are covered by insurance companies? Because you have those two components as well that people can pay you directly for yeah. th your services, depending on what their interests are. And then there's the physical um, component where people this practice could be pra um, covered by health insurance. Right. So tell us more about that. Sure. So for the people that live in the area where I physically have a location, I'm on the Ohio Pennsylvania border. My office is in Hubbard, Ohio. Um, and that office is where I am an employee, where we accept insurance. So for people seeking services covered by insurance, and although some of this sounds very non-insurance covered, I feel very confident in my abilities to appropriately um, streamline this type of an approach through an insurance supported and based realm. So. People physically nearby, they often see me in that practice sit setting. So um, I can bill the exercise piece or the Tai Chi and Qigong is, is billed under neuromuscular re-education. It's a standard component looking at um, all of the science-based stuff that we just did, actually. I just have a different way of um, selecting my word choice. So that becomes something for the in-person realm. In my Be Well Therapies practice, um, I do everything virtually. I can see people from a physical therapy perspective if they're in the state of Ohio, Pennsylvania, or Florida. And for people who are not in those states but may want to have an intervention, if it's appropriate, and it doesn't need to be a skilled physical therapy um, realm, then I see people as a health coach, or I see people as a yoga instructor or a Tai Chi instructor, and we will do virtual individualized one-on-one -on -one training where I can um, customize a program, teach a class, um, help people know what not to do. So if they're going to a community class, they have a little better understanding of what's safe in their body, what feels right. So then they can continue to either take classes from their home or, um, again, go to community classes. Um, and then we have a variety of on-demand. Um, I have the on-demand. There's a few Tai Chi classes in the on-demand. And then there's on our website, there's the shop where there's pre-recorded classes that are available for purchase. And then I have three, four, four online courses. Um, one is all about looking at nutrition from a lifestyle medicine perspective. But in that nutrition piece, we're also teaching and integrating yogic concepts like breathwork, meditation, journaling, mind body skills practices. So that's broken down into three months. There's a week one through 12, months one, two, and three um, that are available. And they come with um, videos. They come with PDFs for links for um, multiple resources. And then there is a class that is physio yoga for back care. So we're looking at spine care looking at traditional exercises, but implementing them through a yogic lens. And there's a lot of time spent on the postural piece and incorporating mindful movement, contemplative movement into the application of these um, evidence-supported exercises. So the nutrition, the journaling, the meditation, the yogic kind of integration are in those courses. And I'm in the process of working on two new courses. One is on sleep and how to posture and position appropriately. And then the other course after that will be um, a Qigong component that is in the process. 
it sounds like you have a wonderful program going. Thank and, you. you know, here you're talking about spine care. And I think many of us do not understand how important it is to prevent spine injuries or, you know, back problems until we're faced with them. And suddenly it's like, now what are we going to do? So do you cover some of those like in terms of preventing injuries? Yeah. So essentially, when I look at the um, physio yoga for back care, that's a great space to you know, I always have to be mindful of um, knowing that I have to speak from a general perspective and not be too yes. specific. So I'm very big on you have to really have a good read on listening to your body. Mm -hmm. Many times people with a lot of, um, I'm going to go with back pain, like they don't have diagnostic tests that say this is a massive problem. They're like, yeah, we have some MRIs and yeah, you know, there's some disc issues or there's some degenerative pieces, but nothing that warrants surgery or anything else, but you could do epidurals or you could go to therapy. And sometimes that therapy is, you know, here's some stretches and mm -hmm. it's not really presented to the individual in terms of, we really have to figure out how you can be in charge of your health in the best way possible. I can provide you with some really good information and education, and then you have to decide what dose is going to be appropriate for you. I cannot mm -hmm. stress enough the value of the use of tennis balls or fascial rounds to mm -hmm. roll. Uh, self myofascial release, the course that I have goes over how to do that from sitting, from standing, from lying. Not everybody can lie on the floor. You don't have to. But okay. we have to really look at what that does to the fascia. And when we talk about energy, Fascia is huge in terms of when it gets tight. Fascia is the saran wrap that lives in our body. There's five different types of fascia. It goes in muscle, through muscle, around muscle, around groups of muscles, over bones, over organs. When that tissue gets tight, it can compress and create a force up to 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Oftentimes, this is the stuff that drives our pain because much like saran wrap, it follows the route, it follows the habit, it follows if I always sit and I slouch, or if I'm always on my computer and my mouse in this way, we create a mold. And then we continue to go to this mold until over time, we've created the shape. And sometimes we have to try to unravel from that shape because we get so compressed and so tight and we get so much pain. And that's not something that's going to show up on an MRI or a CT scan, but that becomes something then that we have to start to learn. How do I start to address this? Rolling on the tennis balls, rolling on fascial rounds is a really great beginning space. It doesn't feel fantastic. In fact, it, you start to work into discomfort, but we then have to differentiate pain from tolerable discomfort much like when we apply acupressure. We want tolerable discomfort. That's to be expected. We don't want pain and symptoms. But starting to work in those ways in a proactive manner, whether we're having symptoms or not, it becomes huge because when that connective tissue starts to become a little more extensible and we add in the hydration piece, which the research shows Drinking half your body weight in ounces of water a day is where we have our optimal hydration. Now, mm -hmm. if you go out and do that right away and drink half your body weight in ounces and you're not used to doing that, you will have problems. You will be dizzy. You will be lightheaded. You'll have an electrolyte imbalance. So don't run out and do that right away. But you start mm -hmm. with, where am I even at? You have to take an assessment of where you are in the moment. How much water do I drink a day? And then we gradually increase every few days a little bit more until we get to this space where we're adequately hydrated, which allows the fascia to respond. We roll on it. It gets a little more extensible. And in the fascia is this um, water-based layer, which conducts the electric component. So now we have this electricity or energy piece in there. And here we are full circle back to energy. That's right. This has been wonderful. Uh, a couple of more things. If you could tell our listeners, uh, what is the best way to learn about your programs, uh, to learn more about you if they are interested? And do you have a final message? 
So BeWellTherapies.org, that is the website, B-E-W-E-L-L-T-H-E-R-A-P-I-E-S.org. Um, my bio is listed on there. The courses that we offer are listed on there. The email contact is listed on there. I run the website, so I filter through all of the emails that come in, any of the contact forms that are completed. Um, there is a way to sign up in terms of registering for a one-on-one -on -one session. And some people have questions like, which, which should I choose? I'm not sure. Email me and I will um, set up a, a way to communicate with you, whether it's through email or whether we want to do a, a short Zoom to figure out what you're looking for and help you determine what option, if you will, to pick. I am licensed and certified under a number of different things, which might make it confusing. So it's not my intention to be confusing, but I also want to detail the variety of services that we can offer. Um, mm -hmm. And my final message, that's a great question. I think um, knowing your intention really matters the most. So the energy goes where your mind is. The mind leads the chi. So mm -hmm. what is your intention? When you show up for a practice, what is your intention? You get out what you put into it. So if we are like, I don't know what my intention is, a suggested intention may be to be present, to be mm -hmm. in this moment, not looking backward, not looking forward, but to be in the now. That's right. I love that. That's a great message too. And that's why we try all these modalities because, uh, yeah, like you say, we want to be in the now. Right. We don't have to do them all. We just need to find one or two that works for us, the individual. I've enjoyed this conversation so much. Thank you, Dr. Kerr, for being with us. Thank you for having me. This is an honor. You've been listening to the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast with your host, Maya Acosta. If you've enjoyed this podcast, do us a favor and share with one friend who can benefit from this episode. Feel free to leave an honest review as well at ratethispodcast.com forward slash HLS. This helps us to spread our message. And as always, thank you for being a listener.